So we're going to make our confession over the word. Everybody say this after me. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, and I'll never be the same after today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're doing a series right now called Salt Life. When you see the Salt Life decal on somebody's back window in front of you, anybody actually have a Salt Life decal on your car? No? Well, the next time you see one on the car in front of you, I want you to see that differently. Salt Life. That's what we are called to live as believers. We're called to live a salt life life. Somebody told me, I began it yes, uh, last Sunday when I taught a message on salt life, and uh, somebody said that message you preached last, uh, well, that was a pretty salty message that you preached last. I, mean, I didn't know how to take that. We're not going to receive, we're not going to take communion today. Uh, next month in October, we're going to take communion together as a church. But I want to talk with you about a part of the communion service. And those of you that have been here at church for a while, if you've been at Living Word for, it's been probably a couple years since I've taught on Salt Covenant. And while we're not having the whole communion service today, I want to talk about Salt Covenant for a moment because when we dip our bread in salt, when, when we have communion here, it's a sign of a covenant that we have. It's, first of all, a sign of a covenant between God or with God. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13 says that all of the offerings that were brought to God were brought to him and seasoned with salt. Numbers chapter 18, verse 19 says salt is an ordinance between God, his priests, and his people forever. Then it's also a sign of the covenant that we have with each other. Mark chapter 9, verse 50, in the Message Bible, if I can read it out of there, says, Have the salt of friendship among yourselves and live in peace with one another. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may how, know how to answer each one. So salt covenant is a covenant uh, that we make with one another when we eat the bread when we receive communion. We're going to do this in October. But today, I want to give you a little bit different spin on Salt Covenant that we've never talked about before. And first of all, I'm just explaining to you the importance of salt in the covenant. If you've ever, if you've never noticed it, the next time you look at a a picture of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. If you look in, there are, there are little bowls of salt on the table in front of the disciples. But if you look in front of Judas, his bowl of salt is turned over. Even Leonardo da Vinci knew that spilled salt was a sign of breaking a covenant. I used to have a neighbor who lived next door who was from Lebanon. And I was talking with him about this salt covenant thing in the Middle East, and he said even in the Middle East today, if you get invited to someone's home and you sit down to eat, the first thing you do is look for the salt. Because if there's salt on the table, they consider you a friend and they trust you. If there's not salt on the table, then the jury's still out. They're not really sure yet of their relationship with you. The power of salt. Now, salt can basically be used for three things. First of all, as a preservative. Second of all, as a purifier. And thirdly, as an antiseptic. First of all, as a preservative. Uh, I know when I was a boy, my grandfather used to hang meat. He would hang hams in the smokehouse. Anybody know what a smokehouse is? It's not a place where you go out and smoke pot. A smokehouse is a place where you smoke meat, you hang meat, and you smoke that meat out there. And he would rub them all down with salt, real coarse salt first, because that salt was a preservative and it would get into the meat. Then as a purifier, 
uh, if you have a well or you have a water system that needs to be purified, the purifiers use salt and run that water through that salt, even in pool uh, filters. You run that water through salt, and salt is a purifier. Thirdly, salt is an antiseptic. When I was a kid, if I got a sore throat, anybody know what they would give me to gargle? Salt water. Why? Because it was an antiseptic and it would, uh, it would uh, uh, bring healing and make my throat feel better. So when we're making commitments to each other, when we have salt covenant communion and we dip our bread in salt, uh, we will oftentimes even verbalize these three commitments together. First of all, as a preservative, I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you. In other words, I'm going to do everything that I can to preserve our relationship together. Second of all, I will always think pure thoughts about you as a purifier. Um, uh, the, the brothers need to think pure thoughts about the sisters. And the sisters need to think pure thoughts about the brothers. And let me just step out on the water and just say in this day and age, we just all need to think pure thoughts about each other. Thirdly, I will allow God to use me to bring healing into your life. In the body of Christ, there are so many opportunities for us to bring healing, for us to love one another and to touch one another. And we want to be careful as the body of Christ that we don't get so busy, we don't get too busy to actually minister to one another, to be a blessing to one another, to bring healing to each other. And this whole idea of loving one another is really important in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says, By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Not love for them, but love for one another. So when people come from the outside to church for the first time and they don't really know what to expect, wonder what it's going to be like, wonder what the music is going to be like, wonder if what the temperature is going to be in there, I wonder uh, if, if we're going to like the message, I wonder if anybody's going to talk to us, and they're, they're kind of wondering, how many of you have ever been to a church for the first time? Some of you didn't raise your hand. I'm trying to figure out how that works. You've never been to a church for, everybody raise your hand. How many of you have ever been to a church for the first time? That's what I thought. Everybody has. We all have. And so we all have this trepidation. We all have this, this uh, concern about what's it going to be like? Especially if you weren't raised in church. Then, that's, then, it's, then that, that uh, uh, sense of, I'm not going to say anxiety, but that sense of anxiousness is elevated. Jesus says that people will know that we're his disciples because we love each other other and so often we spend so much time so much energy so much money trying to minister to everybody else and we should I'm going to talk about that in a minute but people need to right off the bat people need to it, it needs to be a really uh, it needs to be something that really connects with people when they see how we love each other you don't want people to come into the church and go wow those, those I don't want to be a part of that they don't even talk to each other. They won't even, they, you know, they don't interact. They don't look like they're having fun. They don't look like they enjoy each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like last week I asked how many of you have the joy of the Lord and almost everybody raised their hand and then we decided that we need to notify our face. And so we, we also need to do that with each other. How many of you actually enjoy serving with each other? Okay, well, that needs to be obvious. People need to see the love of God between us. They need to see that we love one another. That, and it's not just words. It's not just, hey, I love you, but that we actually connect with each other, that there's actually a bond that people can see. So this is really, really important. But I've preached on everything I've, pre everything I've talked about. I've preached on this several times here at the church. But this loving one another must be balanced with loving those outside of the faith and outside of church. You see, you can, you can spend all of your energy loving people outside of church and not love one another, but the opposite is true. We can spend all of our energy loving one another and ignore people that are outside the church or outside the faith. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus was asked this question, Teacher, 
which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So when Jesus is talking about the greatest commandments, first of all, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Uh, I think we could have guessed that one, couldn't we? I found it fascinating that Jesus said the second one, Jesus is not saying loving one another is not important. I think we already established that, didn't we? Who's here? We already established that loving one another is important, didn't we? We, already, uh, we know that forgiving one another is important. We know reading the word is important. We know praying daily is important. We know all of those things are important to the Christian life. But it's amazing that Jesus says the first most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second most important commandment, be sure you pray every day. Love one another. Second most important commandment. Second most important commandment. Be sure you forgive each other. No, all those are important, but Jesus said the second most important commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think we need to elevate this commandment in our thinking. To love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, I believe that in order to, I, I get the teaching, there are a lot of books being written and a lot of teaching about in order to love your neighbor as yourself, you first of all have to love yourself. So, so I get that. But there are, but people have taken that and now you can go to bookstores and go online and you can find myriads of books and CDs and things on loving yourself based on that scripture right there and very, very little material on loving your neighbor as you love yourself. We've used that scripture to justify, oh, I need to love myself. Hey, hey and I'm all for it. I'm on the bandwagon. It's great. You've got to do that. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. But let's get back to loving our neighbor. So Luke chapter 10, this same account though, Luke goes a little bit farther and he uh, where is this Luke chapter 10 verse 25 this certain lawyer said teacher what shall I do to inherit eternal life and he said what is written in the law what's your reading of it and the lawyer said you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength and your neighbor as yourself and Jesus said you have answered rightly do this and you will live but the lawyer wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And instead of telling him, well, you need to watch Mr. Rogers, <laughs> Jesus answered him and he gives him a parable. And he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who were hated by the Jews, by the way, Samaritans, uh, Jews and Gentiles, Jews did not mix with Gentiles. Jews did not uh, fellowship with Gentiles because they considered them to be unclean. But Jews really hated Samaritans because Samaritans had intermarried. They were Jews and Gentiles that had intermarried and the things that Jews hated worse than Gentiles were Samaritans because they had violated the law. And so this Samaritan as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion, he cared. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own, put him in his own car, and brought him to church, and took care... Um, whoops. 
set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, which by the way is two days wages. A denarii was one day's average wage back then. And he gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I'll repay you. So which of these three, Jesus asked the lawyer, do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, the one that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So Jesus is answering the question here is, who is my neighbor? It's not the guy that lives next door. It is, but it's not. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers this question with this parable. And it's not the people that live next door. It's the people that you encounter who are in need. And we have to change our thinking as a church if we're going to be New Testament Christians. When you're driving down the road and you see someone in need, that person becomes your neighbor. Very quiet in this Presbyterian church. Three people came by. One was a priest. One was a Levite, one was a priest, and one was a Samaritan. Now, the first guy that came by ignored him. He walked over on the other side of the road and completely ignored him. Oh, there's a guy that's in need. I'm going to walk on this side of the road. The next person, the Bible says, went over and looked at him. Yep, that guy's in bad shape. And then he continues on his journey. But the last person, the Samaritan, and these two guys are enemies, by the way. The last person, the Samaritan, looked on him and he had compassion on him. So the question, when we see someone who is in need, who is not a part of the faith, or not a part of the church, or we don't even know where they are in their spiritual journey, when we see that person, do we, number one, oops, there's a need and I'm busy, and don't even look, or are we the person that goes and looks and then continues on our way? Yep, you are in bad shape, buddy. Prayers for you, buddy. Or are we the person who has compassion and ministers to them. Everybody okay so far? You won't be now. The man who needed help, take a deep breath. The man who needed help didn't ask for it. That's usually our benchmark that's usually our opportunity to respond is when someone says can you help me this guy was unable to express that he needed help I've done it myself I know this is not jump and shout preaching that's next week but we, we, need, to, we need to talk about this don't we as a church because I've done it myself. Well, yeah, but if, if they need help, they'll ask for it. They hadn't said anything. Connie's very sensitive. Connie's very, honey, I think, this, I think maybe this person needs this. I think maybe we should call this person. I think maybe this person needs help. And I'm, I'm notorious for saying, honey, I haven't heard. If, I'm sure if they need help, they'll ask for it. This guy didn't. So what does that make me? Am I the priest or the Levite? I'm not the Samaritan when I do that. Now the lawyer asked this question of Jesus. Who is my neighbor? And the Bible says he asked that question because he wanted to justify himself. So what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the guy 
the Bible says in order to justify himself, in other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question because this is going to make me look real good. All right, Jesus, so who is my neighbor? This is going to sound so good. And then Jesus gives him this parable about this Samaritan, and I'm sure he goes, oh my. He wanted to justify himself. I'm a good person. So, see, what I want you to see is this neighbor issue is a really important issue to God. It's the second most important commandment. Who knows we need to love one another? Look at your neighbor and say, I love you. Yeah, that was uncomfortable, wasn't it? We need, to, we need to love one another. We need to love each other, and we need to demonstrate that. And Jesus said, people on the outside will know that the people on the inside are his disciples because we love one another. It's important. How many of you know that without forgiveness, you're not, if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you're not going to get past that to become everything God wants you to be? How many of you know that speaking the word and standing on the word and understanding the word, how vitally important that is? Every day we need to pray, communicate with God, and speak his word in prayer. How many of you know all that's important? But Jesus said the second most important commandment is you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So who is my neighbor? It's not the guy living next door. It's the person you know who's in need. And every single person in this building today knows somebody who's hurting. I don't want to hear anybody say, well, I don't really know anybody. I don't know anybody that's hurting. Oh, yeah, you do. We all do. You might even be suspecting that they're hurting. Everybody knows somebody who is spiritually needy. This is referring to a physical need and a physical, and I even talked about people broken down on the side of the road and that need help and all that. But we, need, we know so many people that are spiritually needy and spiritually hurting and their marriages are hurting, their finances are hurting, their health is hurting, their relationships are hurting. And they're not, they may not even be a part of a faith community. They may not be a part of a church. They may not be Christians, but we know that they're hurting and it's our responsibility as good samaritans to love our neighbor and that's them they may be they may live next door to you absolutely they may be in your family you know people in your family can be your neighbor yeah i got a cousin that's really going through this right now that person becomes your neighbor it could be a co-worker could somebody be somebody you work out at the gym with that person regardless of their proximity to your home is your neighbor so I want to suggest, and this is going to be really radical, and I don't want anybody to suggest that we are taking the blood of Jesus out of communion because we're not, we're, ha we're not having communion today. We're going to have that in October. But what I do want us to do is look at the part of the salt covenant that has to do with others. The salt covenant, dipping our bread in salt and making commitments to each other. I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you. I will always think pure thoughts about you. And I will allow God to use me to bring healing into your life. And I believe we need to make those commitments to our neighbors. It's really heartbreaking to me that we have neighbors that don't want to connect with church, don't like church, don't want, you know, we talked about that last week, remember, I, oh, I did the church thing, because they've never been to a church with salt in it. They've never, never been to a salty church. A church with salt on it. They've never experienced that. And so, so it's like eating a, uh, it's like eating food that's unseasoned and going, no, that's not very, I mean, I could eat it, but I don't really want to. It's not very good. But you put some salt on it, and all of a sudden, this is really good stuff. And it's the same way, you know, if church will put some salt on it, and we'll lead salty lives, salt lives, salt life, decal, sticker in the window. You see what I did there? And we'll lead salt lives then people will want to connect with what they see when they come in and they see that we love one another. I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you. 
I usually say I don't want to get emails, but that's not going to help here. I'm going to get them anyway. But I think, uh, I think we are not conscientious enough of what we post on social media not only when it comes to loving one another but when it comes to loving our neighbor we're so consumed with people understanding our particular political persuasion that we forget that there's a whole world out there watching the church fight and it's so disheartening to see that because people aren't thinking about our neighbor and I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you. So what if your neighbor that you need to minister to and you need an avenue to minister to, what if they are a Trump supporter? Yeah, I went there. What if they're an Obama supporter? What if your neighbor that you minister to hopes Donald Trump runs for a second term so that they can vote for him? And what if your neighbor hopes President Obama comes back and runs again so he can vote for him? And we get so wrapped up in being sure our neighbor knows our particular political persuasion and how right we are that we forget that God could use us to bring healing into their life. But we have just built a wall and alienated them. I'm not saying don't have political views, and, and uh, all of us do. But when we make salt covenant with each other, I mean, we got, all, we got Democrats, Republicans, independents in this church. Awesome. Awesome. But we need to think, oh, you know, well, they're, you know, they're just, they're, they just, you know, if they're going to be Christians, they need to get over it if I offended them well let's take that one step further and talk about people who aren't Christians and it's not their responsibility to get over it yeah I went there I went there because we need to grow up and we need to be the body of Christ and we need to think about this second commandment you shall love your neighbor the person who's hurting the person who needs ministry the person who needs a touch from God we should love them as we love ourselves and their well-being needs to be as important to us as ours is I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you I will always think pure thoughts about you let's think pure thoughts about our neighbors and our friends and then thirdly I will allow God to use me to bring healing into your life wow I will allow God to use me I was riding my I'm not saying this to impress you because I, I told you I've messed up a lot of times when it comes to this neighbor thing but yesterday I did do something good for a change because I yeah finally is right I was I was out riding my motorcycle and I happened to ride through. I thought it was just a parked car sitting by the side of the road and I happened to go past him all the way to a stop sign and this guy is on the side of the road with his hood up. And if you've ever tried to duck waddle a motorcycle backwards 100 yards, that's... No, so I drive all the way. I'm looking for a place to turn around and I'm driving and driving and driving, trying to find a place to turn around. And uh, so fi finally, you know, I'm a half a mile later, I turn around and come back and the guy was fine. But at the time that I drive by him and I see that he has a need, he becomes... My neighbor. He's my neighbor. Do you ever drive by past somebody? Hey, there's a... If you want to freak somebody out who hadn't heard this message, drive past somebody you don't know who's broken down on the side of the road and say, oh, there's my neighbor. Really, you live next to the door to that guy? No, I don't. I don't live next door to him. But our neighbors, I want to talk about spiritually. There are people that are spiritually hurting on the inside. Spiritually hurting on the inside their finances, their health, their marriage, their relationships, their job, spiritually. We may not be able to solve their issue for them, but we 
are their neighbors and we need to see them through this so right now very very quickly but say quickly I want to see how fast you can do this we're passing out bread and salt no juice just bread and salt this is not a full please don't go out of here and say they're taking the blood out of communion we're not having communion so it's bread and salt and we're going to pass this down the rows and I want you to take a piece of bread and dip it in the salt and pass it down the road as fast as humanly possible because they're taking this off my preaching time your your slowness in passing this down is cutting into my preaching time And once you have received it, I would like for you to stand up. That's how I know everybody has it. Everybody? All right. Now. I don't know where you live and I don't know where you work and I don't know who your neighbors are and I don't know who you know but this is north Capitol Boulevard goes that way that's north that's south that's east toward the coast and that's west toward California and what I want you to do is take a moment and I want you to think where the person is that you know is hurting the most the person that you know that God could use you to minister to them and I want you to turn toward them if it's at work turn toward your work if it's at your home near your home next door turn toward your home if it's downtown if it's at the gym turn toward the gym but I want you to get your some of you look like you like a cow at a new gate staring at a new gate you have no idea north Capitol Boulevard south toward Raleigh west toward California thank you and uh, I'm going to dip this in salt and the way I see these people right here I'm just going to turn toward them (laughs) I want you to turn toward the person that you know has a need that God could use you to minister to actually the person I know is this way right here got it got it it? And I want you to make this commitment to them. I want you to close your eyes now, your face toward them, and I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to see their face. And I want you to say this to them. I will never say or do anything on purpose to hurt you. I will allow, um, I will always think pure thoughts about you. I will allow God to use me to bring healing into your life in Jesus name amen let's eat the bread with the salt on it and as you taste the salt on that I want you to remember the commitment that you've made to this person you may be seated